this is yet another opportunity. Uh, it's not the first and it won't be the last that allows criminals to avoid incarceration. These folks should be participating in these programs because it's the right thing to do and as a way to keep them from coming back to jail. That's the point. A lot of times these programs or classes are things that an offender has agreed to do as a condition of probation. And so things that they are required to do by law and pursuant to their release are things that we are giving them extra credit for to get out of jail early. We understand the need and the desire of sheriffs to manage their population. But now that the predicted consequences of realignment are coming to pass, the response that we are seeing, not only in this bill but in others, is to weaken our response to crime. We're letting them out anyway, so why don't we get them to do something? They're not doing anything. They know they're going to get out. They know that their sentences are being reduced because of overcrowding. And this doesn't seem to be a very good incentive. It's just another way to let folks out early. There have to be consequences for criminality, and we would ask for your no vote respectfully. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Any uh, comments from uh, committee members? Mr. Hagman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And you know, the purist in me says we are totally failing at the public obligation to have this deterrence to keep criminals from doing criminal activity in the first place. The reality in me says our jails are overcrowded, so what do we do with them? Um, so I have this conflict going on. So I was hoping that the author or our witnesses can explain what's going on right now. What options do you have at the table? What options does this add? So I understand we, we can sentence people to home detention work programs right now, so they're out of custody. I understand we do get work time, but half that time right now has to be toward going back to the public good. So why aren't the tools there meeting the, the necessities that you have um, to manage that population, and how does this make it better, I guess? Go ahead, ma'am. Go ahead. AB 2127 um, allows us to allow an inmate to go back into the community, into his or her home, and continue working in their already gainfully employed job, which keeps their families off of welfare and keeps them from losing their jobs. Um, like you said, they're going to get out anyway. We might as well make them responsible and um, direct them in that direction. They also would be allowed to participate in life skill classes and drug abuse treatment programs, et cetera. Mr. Knight. That's fine. Who would have to do manual labor, pick up trash, do that if we pass this bill? I'm sorry, say that again, Bill. Would anybody have to do any type of manual labor? Would anybody have to do any type of trash pickup, cleanup around the courts, anything like that if we pass this bill? Yes, those who don't want don't have a regular job and don't want to go and get one, and those that do not want to participate in those treatment programs. Um, and they're um, a non-serious, non-violent, non-sex offender, if they had the money to pay the administrative fee to go into the work release program, they would be able to do that, that okay. we currently have. And, and I, I get where you're going with this, uh, but I think I have to agree with the opposition that at some point uh, people have to do the penalty phase for, for the crime. And they would be required to serve a percentage of their time before they would even be eligible, just like they are for work release. But we're jumping up, um, giving someone um, education, we're giving giving them some sort of drug aversion, those types of, of, of kind of penalty uh, takeaways, uh, and we're giving them the same thing for a uh, looking for a job. Um, I think that, the, that most reasonable people would look at that and say, if you're looking for a job, well, we want you to look for a job, and that's great. And people who don't have a job should probably look for a job. But we're not going to give you 100% credit for looking for a job. It's not 100% credit. They only get credit for a certain period of time. And if they don't become gainfully employed, then they wouldn't qualify for that. All right. And Mr. Hagman, lastly. Sorry, just a follow-up. Um, you're saying that a certain percentage of time has to be served in custody and those formulas. I didn't see that language in the bill, so where is that stipulated as far as 
time percentage in the bill? I mean, uh, time in custody or anything like that. How's that calculated? Okay, you've got me there. I'll have to research that um, section that states that they are required to serve a percent, uh, certain percentage of their time before they're even eligible for work release. Yeah. Anything on that, Mark? All right, thank you. And uh, would you, any other questions or comments from the committee members? Ms. Casada? Again, just to kind of um, respond to some of the concerns, we're open to working if it's uh, trying to find some language to specify that uh, we have to, you know, ensure that these inmates, and that's, that's what existing law is, that they have to serve some uh, period of time. Uh, but if that makes you more comfortable, we're open to any suggestions you might have. Um, so again, members, um, this bill is intended to reduce recidivism by allowing these inmates to not only be able to participate in educational programs, because that helps, as, as many of you know, um, it helps uh, the families to make sure that people reintegrate back into society. And so by allowing the inmates to actually get credit for participating in jobs, and making sure that they maintain those jobs, we will enable them to, to reintegrate faster into our society. And um, again, I just something that I wanted to point out, education and employment, I think, are key components of full rehabilitation. And with that, members, I respectfully ask for your aye vote. All right, thank you very much. And uh, you, you can tell the member that you, you did a really sterling job. We appreciate you. your uh, knowledge of this bill uh, and the nuances. Um, I'm very supportive of this bill. Any incentive we can give to help people get their lives back together. This doesn't mean that it's carte blanche, but it's also taking the kind of responsibility we need to take uh, uh, because it's multidimensional, um, um, the, the kind of um, uh, uh, purviews that we're addressing, whether it's overcrowding or circumstantial. Um, and I find this uh, to be a testament to a, a, a just society. So I recommend an I vote. I believe we need a motion. All right, motion and moved. And if you have a roll call, please. Amiano? Aye. Amiano, aye. Knight? No. Knight, no. Cedillo? Aye. Cedillo, aye. Hagman? Hagman, not voting. Mitchell? Aye. Mitchell, aye. Skinner? Aye. Skinner, aye. The bill's out. All right, thank you. I have two bills to present. I'm pulling one uh, off consent, and uh, we will be presenting that and uh, bring it. Chair Amiano, you have uh, 1707 and 2029. Uh, yes, I'd like to start with 2029, if I may. Okay, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> AB 2029 reestablishes the Bail Fugitive Recovery Persons Act, which requires that all bail fugitive recovery persons, i.e. bounty hunters, meet specified education, notice, and conduct requirements. The Act's original provisions required bail fugitive recovery persons to be at least 18 years of age and specified background, training, education, and documentation, docu, uh, documentation requirements. <clears throat> the Act sunsets on January 1st, 2010, or did sunset, and since that time, the California Department of Insurance Investigation Division has experienced a significant amount of cases in which bounty hunters have overstepped appropriate if not legal boundaries in their apprehension of bail fugitives. These disturbing cases illustrate the need to reinstate the act. There are some minor additions that I've added to the bill after meeting with representatives from the bail industry and other interested parties. With me is Michael Martinez, Deputy Commissioner from the Department of Insurance, who will provide more information about the need for this bill, and Mr. Randall Perry as well. Witnesses in support. Hello, good morning, Michael Martinez here on behalf of Insurance Commissioner Dave Jones and the California Department of Insurance. We are the sponsor of this measure and we ask for your I vote on this important consumer protection measure. Uh, the Department of Insurance, we do regulate the bail industry, bail agents, uh, producers, and another component is that bail re fugitive recovery persons, commonly known as bounty hunters, have been carrying out their business without any specified education notice and conduct requirements since this act had uh, sunset on January 1st, 2010, and so we believe that uh, this act is is needed in order to reestablish it in the penal code section, 
and it would further, we feel, actually provide enhanced uh, professionalism to this profession. We feel that it would provide, uh, reinstitute CDA's oversight of these bounty hunters by establishing a specified eligibility requirements, satisfied notice and conduct requirements, and create safety mechanisms for coordination with law enforcement profi uh, professionals. So, as uh, the author had conveyed, the March 20th amendments, uh, amended version of the tax, we did meet with uh, the bail industry to, how, uh, to figure out ways we can further make the bill workable and look forward to your I vote. I vote. There's no opposition to this measure um, at, at this point as reflected in the analysis. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members, Randy Perry, on behalf of PORAC, we're in support of the bill. Any other witnesses in support? Hank in the middle. Curtis Hill on behalf of the California State Sheriff's Association in support. Ignacio Hernandez on behalf of the California Attorneys for Criminal Justice in support of the bill. Libby Sanchez, California Public Defenders Association, also in support. Witnesses in opposition or a tweener? A tweener. Um, Kathy Lynch representing the California Bail Agents Association and Golden State Bail Agents Association. And I first want to publicly uh, thank the author and his staff and the Department of Insurance for meeting with us. The last set of amendments that went in the bill are a result of those conversations. We're um, in the process of scheduling another meeting to discuss three remaining issues that we have with the bill, but they are important issues. Uh, the first one is training. When the original statute went in in 1999-2000, um, bail agents were grandfathered in for training purposes um, because obviously if they're chasing their own fugitive, they already undergo continuing education. We're talking about a new statute. The, the law had sunsetted for two years, so there's been a two-year lacks of time, so we would like to see um, them also grandfathered in as the new statute would go forward. That's number one. The second amendment is Section 844, which um, impacts only felons uh, in terms of uh, fugitive recovery. M many, in fact, most of the, the fugitive recovery work that we do involves misdemeanors, and misdemeanors can run into the thousands of dollars, and so to that extent, we would like to see the provisions of 844 also apply to the misdemeanor category so that we can also do that fugitive recovery work. And then we believe the third amendment is a technical amendment where 13, section 1300 and 1301 in one place, 1300 is omitted from the language, but it affects the misdemeanor class classification. And so we really believe that amendment needs to also go in the bill. And with that, um, we are technically opposed to the bill, but in good working relationship with the author. Celestine IV. Uh, my family's been in the bail bond business since 1947, and uh, we're technically opposed to this bill because it will effectively, if we are not granted the 844 position, put the uh, bail industry out of business as it currently exists, and that'll probably put about 20,000 people out of work. Thank you. Thank you. Any other witnesses in opposition? Members' comments? Senator Hagman? Well, I want to thank the author, too, for, for bringing up the issue. I think 99% of it is needed and wanted for the industry. Um, a couple of concerns were brought up to you late today as far as the ability for the bondsman to effectively do his job and just want to have some kind of assurances if this bill gets passed out as is going forward that those could at least be looked at and discussed and possibly uh, modified to keep status quo as far as the apprehension of misdemeanors out in the field is, you know, the main thing right there is uh, like like the witnesses portrayed to probably 75% of the business is misdemeanors if you don't have the right to forcibly uh, obtain those defendants and bring them back to court, then the, the will not be a bail industry left. And so I'm just hoping to get that assurances from you at this point. Okay. Thank you, any other comments? Ms. Mitchell. I just want a clarification from the opposition witness with regard to the grandfathering in. Is, is it your expectation that um, um, current 
bondsmen be grandfathered in and not go into have the additional training requirement? Is um, that the grandfathered in notion? Um, thank you for the question. Um, two points on that. Uh, bail bondsmen already undergo their own continuing education program. And in addition, there's a bill, AB 2303, a committee bill that's moving on pre-licensure, which actually increases mm. the body of law to 20 hours um, for that. So we're, we're very much supportive of continuing education. I think because of the cost and the economic times, it what we're asking asking for, though, is for bail agents that aren't going outside to hire separate bounty hunters, that when they're recovering their own fugitive, which they're allowed to do, that they not have to go through that additional training, that they should be grandfathered in as they were done in the original statute. Got it. Thank, Thank you for that clarification. Okay. Thank you very much. Do we have a motion? Second. Bill's been moved and seconded. Would you like to close? Yes. Uh, uh, you know, all this sounds good to me, and uh, actually I am glad that we did air this. I think it's important for the public to know, and uh, I uh, enjoy a very good relationship uh, with all the stakeholders and my committee members, and uh, I would like to assure you that we are going to be continuing to work. The department, Mr. Jones from the Department of Insurance, Mr. Martinez, um, and so uh, given all that, I would uh, recommend an I vote. Thank you, Mr. Amiano. We do have a, it's been moved and seconded. Can we call the roll? Amiano? Aye. Amiano, aye. Knight? Aye. Knight, aye. Cedillo? Aye. Cedillo, aye. Hagman? Aye. Hagman, aye. Mitchell? Aye. Mitchell, aye. Skinner? Aye. Skinner, aye. The bill's out. Okay, that bill's out. We can move on to AB 1707. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, thank you for the opportunity to present AB 1707. The Attorney General administers the Child Abuse Central Index, CACI, on which reports of al alleged physical abuse, sexual abuse, and mental emotional abuse and or severe neglect of a child are kept. The information in CACI is predominantly used by regulatory agencies to assist in such things as screening applicants for licensing or employment in child care facilities and foster homes and aiding in background checks for other possible child placements and adoptions. Children can be listed on CACI as, per as uh, perpetrators of physical abuse if they injure another child in circumstances other than a mutual fight or an accident. Children can also be listed uh, as perpetrators of sexual abuse due to any reported sexual behavior between child and another child, even if the behavior is consensual. Children in the foster care system are especially vulnerable to being listed because they may act out during past abuse and because their behavior is subject to closer scrutiny by child welfare agency caseworkers than that of children in the general population. AB 1707 provides an avenue for the removal of single offense minors uh, from that list, specifically if a person is listed as a perpetrator of abuse due to an incident that occurred when the person was under 18 years old, the listing shall be removed from the list 10 years after the incident if no other incidences have occurred. By, by such purging of these listings of non-reoffending minors, AB 1707 would protect youth from suffering lifelong restrictions on job opportunities and licensing eligibility due to misbehavior that occurred when they were under 18. Um, I do have a number of witnesses in support and uh, very much uh, would appreciate your consideration. Thank you. If we can have the witnesses in support. Hello, uh, Committee Chairman and uh, my name is Laura Fair, and I'm the Education Rights Director for Public Council. We are proud to sponsor Assembly Bill 1707, which removes young adults' names from the Child Abuse Central Index if they are listed due to an incident that occurred when they were minors and if 10 years have passed with no additional reported incidents. It is truly a sad irony that a database developed to protect children from abuse can actually harm children themselves by listing them as perpetrators of child abuse. Children in the foster care system, the children we work with every day, are especially vulnerable to being listed on the Casey because they may act out due to past abuse and because they are in the system and under very close supervision. Foster youth chances of success in adult life can be severely compromised if they are listed on the Casey. The listing creates a lifelong stigma and can prevent them from being employed in jobs such as child care, education, law enforcement, or from ever becoming foster adoptive parents. AB 1707 would not delete useful information that is unavailable from other sources. It would not compromise child safety. 
The bill would remove only the Casey listings of single incidents that occurred when a person was under 18 and no other incident is reported for 10 years' time. It's a long time. If such a single incident were truly serious, it would likely have led to arrest, criminal, or delinquency proceedings, and these records, as well as the Casey, are accessible to licensing agencies and employers already. We ask for your vote in support to give youth a chance to become productive and self-supportive adults without being unfairly burdened for life due to childhood misbehavior. Thank you. Thank you. Next witness. Good morning, committee members. Brenda Dabney, firm director with the Children's Law Center of California. The Children's Law Center of California is proud to co-sponsor AB 1707. We represent all dependent children in both Los Angeles and Sacramento counties in their dependency cases. Too often, our clients find themselves listed on the C Child Abuse Central Index, the CACI, for activities they participated in while living in foster homes for very brief periods after experiencing trauma in their own families, many times physical or sexual in nature. And it is a sad reality that our clients are sometimes placed into homes that do very little to help them heal and learn how to function as part of a normal family. They are moved from foster home to foster home with great frequency and are expected to adapt to new environments and to bond with other children in homes as siblings with, with each new move. During the time they are supposed to be healing, they are experiencing the added stress of learning new rules and family customs while their bodies and minds continue to develop and deal with their past experiences. Unlike their peers, when these children then begin to have the same curiosities as children outside of the foster care system, their conduct can and often does lead to a listing on the khaki. Out of concern for their licenses, foster parents generally err on the side of reporting any incident believed to fall within their mandated reported duties. Where parents outside of the system respond with love, set boundaries, and even impose consequences for undesirable conduct, children in foster care are reported to CPS or law enforcement, again thwarting any chance at healing. For the foster child whose misbehavior at the age of 14 led to a khaki report, life turns out very different from his peers. The 24-year-old former foster youth is a different person than the one who experimented with another child living in a temporary home 10 years earlier. An adult who has successfully navigated an under-resourced system and past abuse can become a valuable part of society with talents and skills and may even improve some of the shortcomings we all know exist in the system. It is unfair to treat these young adults as potential child abusers where they have not had more than a single offense during their dependency. They should be allowed to contribute to society and truly heal from their past abuse. AB 1707 will help them do that, and CLC of California urges you to vote aye on the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, the rules of public safety are two witnesses in support and two in uh, opposition. So if we can have uh, me too's. Certainly, Mr. Chair. Kathy Senderling with the County Welfare Directors Association. We're also in support of the bill. Thank you. Julie Basco with the Attorney General's Office. While we are not in support or opposition, we do appreciate the author's office working us, with us from the beginning so that we have clear language so we're able to manage the index as intended. Thank you. Thank you. Libby Sanchez on behalf of the California Public Defenders Association in strong support of this important measure. Thank you. Rebecca Gonzalez, National Association of Social Workers, California Chapter in support. Maureen Pacheco, Center for Juvenile Law and Policy in support. Ignacio Hernandez on behalf of CACJ in support. Thank you very much. Any witnesses in opposition? Mr. Chairman, members, Corey Salzillo on behalf of the California District Attorneys Association. Uh, in opposition to the bill, there is a uh, valid uh, need to have records of abusive acts against children, and CACI is that repository. You'll remember that this committee approved a bill last year, AB 717, also by the author, that limited the reports, the nature of the reports that are listed in CACI to those that are substantiated. Uh, so what we are saying is that going forward, the reports in the CACI have been substantiated. There are reasons uh, that there might be substantiated reports of child abuse that do not result in criminal charges. That's not uncommon. Um, there may be a reason why there wasn't enough evidence to prove in a court of law that, an, that a, an act of child abuse 
had taken place, but it's important that we have a repository for those records because khaki reports can be helpful in investigation and prosecution of future acts. We can get CPS reports and records, and interviews, and just because the history uh, in the khaki was of a juvenile and just because it's 10 years old, is those aren't good enough reasons to remove it, especially since we have converted the khaki to solely substantiated reports. We'd ask for your no vote. Thank you. Any other witnesses in opposition? Members comments? Would you like to close? We don't Thank have you, a motion Mr. On Chair. The bill yet. Uh, uh, yes, I would. I mean, I, I do understand the concerns, but I think they're far outweighed um, by the, in a sense, the overcrowding of non-substantiated um, cases on the khaki. And that's we're trying to make it more effective so that uh, those on the list will be commensurate, the uh, that consequence is commensurate to, to the crime. I do think that um, uh, the bill we passed last, uh, last year was fine. However, uh, one year is not going to result in the, the necessary cleanup. So uh, basically, uh, we're just out of the starting gate. And uh, uh, given the, um, the uh, issue of the juvenile and under 18, I think that is extremely uh, a valid lens to look at uh, these listings with, and so I would recommend an I vote, or ask for an I vote, sorry. Second. Bill has been moved and seconded, and we'll accept that as your close. Can we call the roll? Armiano? Aye. Armiano, aye. Knight? Knight not voting. Cedillo? Aye. Cedillo, aye. Hagman? Mitchell? Aye. Mitchell, aye. Skinner? Aye. Skinner, aye. The bill's out. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to go um, on the consent calendar as it now exists, a little different from the beginning of the meeting. So it'll be item number 10 and item number 15, Portentino and Nielsen. And uh, we need a, got a motion and a second, and now a roll call. Is there a second? I'm sorry. Okay, great. Amiano? Aye. Amiano, aye. Knight? Aye. Knight, aye. Cedillo? Aye. Cedillo, aye. Hagman? Mitchell? Aye. Mitchell, aye. Skinner? Aye. Skinner, aye. It's out. It's out. It's out. On call, so it's out. All right, here are some uh, on calls. Uh, item number two, AB 5028, uh, Donnelly. Mitchell? No. Mitchell, no. That bill fails two to five, and uh, it comes with reconsideration, a request for reconsideration. Without and without objection. Excuse me? Two to four. All right, and then um, again, Mr. Donnelly, AB 1571, uh, crimes, human smuggling. Mitchell? Mitchell, no. All right, the bill fails. And, um, uh, reconsideration. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. I'm sorry, Miss Mitchell, what did you say? No. No. Mitchell, no. That bill fails and it's been granted reconsideration. All right, that bill fails and been granted reconsideration. Number, f uh, number uh, five, uh, Mr. Wykowski. Uh, Traffic offenses, additional penalty, spinal cord injury. Uh, number five, AB 1657. Cedillo? Yeah. Cedillo, aye. Skinner? Aye. Skinner, aye. That bill has passed. That bill has passed. And then uh, AB 1709, Mitchell. Uh, that's number seven. Juvenile story trial. That bill has passed. And then AB 1849, Ms. Carter, uh, I recommendation, Juveniles Restorative Justice. Skinner? Aye. Skinner, aye. Cedillo? Aye. Cedillo, aye. That bill has passed. 
that bill has passed. And I believe lastly, number 14. We need a motion and a second on number 14. Mr. Swanson, AB 2040, Prostitution, Human Trafficking, Expungement. Okay, there we go. Now a roll call. Amiano? Aye. Amiano? Aye. Knight? Knight? No. Cedillo? Aye. Cedillo? Aye. Hagman? Mitchell? Aye. Mitchell? Aye. Skinner? Aye. Skinner? Aye. That bill is out. All right, that bill is out. And I understand that uh, Mr. Hagman wanted to add on. Return? Okay, so uh, can he add on after adjournment? Yeah. Yes, yes, if you stay here for just a minute, because I think other people have some add-ons. All right, we're going to wait just a bit. Otherwise, we 